So let me officially greet everybody. Good early morning to our friends in North and South America. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe. Good early evening to our friends in the Arab states and in India. Good evening to our friends in Thailand, Indonesia. Malaysia, Singapore. And good late evening to our friends in Australia. We have some questions, Jason. Question one, Venerable Ajahn. I'm interested to learn Satipatthana Sutta from Tan Ajahn, a perspective from a monk. I'm following your talks for some time now, and your talks inspire me. I have recently done Satipatthana course from Goenka tradition. Would you please teach us as Vasa is also just around the corner? We'll be highly grateful. Yes. So we're now already in the Vasa, Rains Retreat, that is. Yes, I can offer some words. So the Satipatthana Sutta is considered a uh, very central, important sutta. It's also quite long and it covers, uh, well, all phenomena. And uh, there are many, what would you call, Dharma doors, gates to liberation in uh, described in, uh, in practicing the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. So I think if I were to try to cover the entire sutta in one session, that would take a good number of hours. So I think we might break it into uh, part one and a part two. And I'll just do, I'll just do what is possible from this in this session. But it is good to, to I find myself, I often refer to the same basic sutras that I know and love, and uh, I don't do a lot of sutra study being part of the practice tradition, we, we're practicing cultivating the Four Foundation, cultivating mindfulness and uh, applying that mindfulness to notice these things and cultivate the mind, purify the mind. So don't, but it probably depends partly on the person's character type. Some people are more intellectual, some people are more academic. And uh, for myself, I just make sure I do my meditation before my arms round. I do my meditation after the arms round and I had a two hour sit in the afternoon as well. And so when I read through the sutta, I have that sense of, yes, that's what I'm trying to do in, in my practice. But sometimes things can get a bit rusty or things can get a bit dull. And it's good to, it's good to look at our practice and from a different perspective or look at it from a different way. And I'm going to put my glasses on because you're going to take me more seriously. Okay, Professor Atro. <laughs> I look more smart now, don't I? <laughs> Let us begin the Satipatthana Sutta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country where there was a town of the Kurus named Kamasa Dhamma. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The blessed one said, bhikkhus, this is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of nibbana, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. What are these four? Here, bhikkhus. A bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware and mindful, 
having put away covetousness and grief for the world. So the phrasing in the suttas is a bit, uh, as you would expect, a little bit archaic. And sometimes the 2,500 plus years ago, and uh, the, sometimes the Pali text scholars, rightly so, they're, they're very determined to be quite precise. But in, in doing that, sometimes uh, doesn't quite capture. And this is why it is good for practice monks to give some commentary on uh, the, because the translations technically are correct, but somehow they don't quite capture the, the in a way, the ordinariness of, the, of, the, of how we practice. So, for example, this phrase, the one abides contemplating the body of the body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. What does that mean? So it means not falling into liking and disliking. So covetousness is craving for, and the grief is disappointment, aversion, etc. So Lumpur Anand so often says, keep the mind in the middle, not falling into liking and disliking. So that's exactly what these phrases mean. One is practicing being aware of the body and trying to keep the mind in the middle, not allowing it to fall into liking and disliking. And that becomes a quality of presence of mind with stability. And then it's possible to see the characteristics of phenomena simply because we're keeping the mind steady with a quality of clarity. So in the contemplation of the body section, uh, Lord Buddha talks about mindfulness of breathing. And how bhikkhus does a bhikkhu abide contemplating the body as a body? Here a bhikkhu, so also it's not just bhikkhus, Lord Buddha at this time had a huge following of bhikkhus and uh, he's addressing people and holding, holding the bhikkhu in a way as the example of the practitioner. So here a bhikkhu can be can be you. You can just insert here a practitioner. So here a bhikkhu, gone to the forest or to the root of the tree or to an empty hut, sits down, having folded his legs crosswise, set his body erect and established mindfulness in front of him. So what does that mean, establishing mindfulness in front of one? You don't, you don't actually try to put your intention in front of yourself. The way I understand this phrase is you are you establish presence of mind. You simply uh, keep your awareness in the body, in the moment. And this is, breath meditation is so wonderful for doing that because it's in the very center of the experience of, of this body and mind. And it's uh, changing moment to moment. And in order, one has to be present to notice those changes and to be with those feelings. So practicing breath meditation is what actually allows us to establish mindfulness in front of us, which is the establishing presence of mind. Ever mindful, he breathes in. Mindful, he breathes out. Breathing in long, he understands, I breathe in long. Or breathing out long, he understands, I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he understands, I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, he understands, I breathe out short. He trains thus. So with regards to that, one doesn't have to be, one doesn't have to notice, oh, that was a long breath and make a comment. Oh, that was a short breath. I know this breath is long. I know this breath is short. The way I understand this, what Buddha is saying that he understands or he knows the breath as it is. It's like breathing in long, he knows it's long. Breathing out long, he knows it's long. Breathing in short, he knows it's short. Breathing out, he knows it's short. So what does that mean? That means you know the you know the breath as it's occurring, is the way I understand that. And so whether it's a long breath or a short breath, we know it as it's occurring, moment by moment. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body, the trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. So some people understand this differently. Some people understand this as meaning knowing the whole body of breath, beginning, middle and end. And then, as I often mention, of the in-breath, beginning, middle, and end of the out-breath. Other people understand it as 
the awareness or the presence of mind is aware of the entire body, but the center of that awareness, is the interest of that awareness is placed on the breathing. But uh, I think the best way to practice mindfulness of the, of the body through breath meditation is simply by doing it a lot. When you practice breath meditation a lot, you, you learn how to do it, you get skilled at it. And uh, he trains thus, I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. So just allowing the mind to be, the, both the body and the mind to be calm, to be still. You know, think of all the various activities we have, moving around, running around. But when we come to sit meditation, we allow the body to, to sit. And, uh, and then we calm the mind and the body also becomes calmed. Just as a skilled lathe operator or his apprentice when making a long turn understands, I make a long turn or when making a short turn understands, I make a short turn. So too, breathing in long, a people understand, I breathe in long, he does. He trains thus, I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. So knowing the breaths as they are, each breath, and allowing the mind to calm down, to become uh, peaceful. In this way, he abides contemplating the body as a body. Internally, he abides contemplating the body as a body externally. So Anajana Nand says, the body within the body, or no, Contemplating the body internally actually means body parts. So when the monks go forth, we get uh, given as our first meditation object, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. It's actually part of the ceremony for becoming a novice. The uh, preceptor gives you this meditation object. So the other body parts of course knowing the body within the body is the lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, blood, all of these things. So knowing the external body, the hair, skin, nails, internal body, blood, organs, or else he abides contemplating in the body its nature of arising, or he abides contemplating in the body its nature of vanishing. So, aware of aging. He abides contemplating in the body its nature of both arising and vanishing. Or, mindfulness that there is a body is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness. So, often when we come to sit meditation, we do a brief kind of a body sweeping. It's just that, it's just that coming into the present moment. The body is a wonderful object to give the awareness, place the awareness and give the interest because why? When we just did a guided meditation, it's because when we give awareness to knowing the feelings on the surface of the skin, we're not thinking about the past, we're not thinking about the future, we're not thinking about other people. It brings us into the moment. And so oftentimes we do this body scan. But then once you've done that and you turn to the breath, you're not really if you're taking breath meditation as your meditation practice, you're not really contemplating the nature of the body at that point. You're going to give the interest to knowing the feelings of the breath as they arise, knowing, as Lord Buddha says, when it's long, one knows it. When it's short, one knows it. Again, because when walking, a bhikkhu understands I'm walking. When standing, he understands I'm standing. When sitting, he understands I'm sitting. And when lying down, he understands I'm lying down. Or he understands accordingly, however, his body is disposed. So a lot of meditation masters do stress the importance of this, that when we, we do our formal meditation, but then we also set the intention. Suppose you have your morning sit. And you do set your intention that you're going to try to maintain the presence of mind and clarity to whatever extent you can. And the way we do that is by being aware of the postures. So when you're walking, you know you're walking. You're walking through doors, you know you're walking through a door. When you're sitting down, you know you're sitting down. You're getting up, you know you're getting up. You're going to the bathroom. It's, it's like self-possession or self-awareness, simply 
knowing what you're doing with this body and mind. And uh, so that's part of the Gaya Gatani Pati, being aware of the body as a body. We know what posture it's in and what we're doing with it. Again, bhikkhu is a bhikkhu, is one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning. Who acts in full awareness, so often kind of comes to mind walking meditation, right? Walking forwards and then walking back and then walking forwards. Who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away. Who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending the limbs. Who acts in full awareness when wearing the robes and carrying the outer robe and bowl. He acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting. He acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating. He acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. So this simply means knowing what you're doing all throughout the day. It's keeping some presence of mind to what the sense spaces, the eye, ears, nose, tongue, body are giving their attention to and uh, what posture the body's in. It's interesting, Lord Buddha says one is mindful eating and when talking. So these are these are times when our mindfulness can get weak and scattered, aren't they? So can uh, we fall into delighting in tastes too much? The mindfulness will tend to get a bit weaker. And when we're talking, obviously we start gossiping or getting into harsh speech. Some of the mindfulness gets weak, the chelators of liking and not liking can get stronger. So the point that we need to be mindful while participating in these activities. In this way, he abides contemplating the body as a body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally. So that's part of the contemplating the body externally is, and is knowing where the body is and what it's doing, what posture it's in. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body. So these wonderful phrases come up and I think it's important to understand that if we if we're fully mindful of a body as body that can lead to liberation it's in the similarly with feelings if we're fully mindful of feelings that can lead to liberation it's where we it's uh and so it's not like at the end of the sutra if you're mindful of all of these things that's how you become liberated right here in the first section awareness of a body as a body. He abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body. So it's like, that's where the practice leads. If we really are mindful of the posture and mindful of the nature of the body, it's going to lead to not clinging to anything in the world. And then the mindfulness will know that too. Bodily parts, a bhikkhu reviews the body up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the head, bound by skin that is full of many kinds of impurity. So, the 32 parts are mentioned. So, that's knowing all of the body parts. Just as though there were a bag with an opening at both ends full of many sorts of grain, such as hill rice, red rice, beans, peas, millet, and white rice, a man with good eyes were to open it and review it thus. A bhikkhu reviews this same body as full of many kinds of impurity. In this body, there are head hairs, etc. In this way, he abides contemplating the body as a body, internally, externally. He abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. So, this is very interesting. It's very kind of affirming. From my studies, my discussions with my own teachers, my reading of the biography of Lumpoman, etc. Many of the arahants of the last century or so seem to have really had the deepest insights and the liberation experiences when doing body contemplation. And so it's very nice to see this right here in the sutta, that uh, in this way, he abides contemplating the body as a body. And it, the last sentence, he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. So that's where that practice leads. And uh, in the beginning, we have to undertake it in a kind of a methodical and disciplined way, and also possibly in, in kind of small doses at first, until we get kind of used to it. But simply seeing the hair of their head as 
hair, earth element, the nails as earth element. Once one gets a real sense for that, and we practicing the breath meditation as the foundation of the practice, but then we can, with the in-breath, we can be breathing in nails, breathing out nails, and you place some awareness and you simply know the nature of nails. And then as you progress, it starts with the dry earth element parts and moves on to the wet parts. But when practitioners really see the elements of the body as they are, the insight is that this is not a self. This is elements. This is earth, just like the mountains are made of earth, just like the sand on the beach. The, it came from earth, come from the food we consume, and it's going back to earth. And when, the, when one trains oneself to just apply the attention to knowing this, this is kind of an antidote to delusion. So the delusion is thinking it's a self, thinking it's beautiful, and thinking it's going to last. This is kind of a habitual latent tendency that we have. We all have it if we're not enlightened. And simply by placing the awareness on knowing what are the teeth, these little white rows of pebble-like things in the mouth, when one really is able to hold mindful awareness on that, the perceiving the body as a self falls away for periods of time. It's, uh, so the, the greed, hatred, and delusion that causes us suffering is based on a foundation of ignorance. Because there is ignorance, which is a dark quality, there is delusion, which is misapprehending things. So we, we, that's the latent tendency, perceiving the body as permanent, as a self, as beautiful, having attraction for it and the bodies of others. And simply in training this mindful awareness to know the, the foundation of mindfulness of the body, the ignorance as to its nature falls away or gets less and less. And when the ignorance is less, but when ignorance is not knowing, mindfulness and clear comprehension is knowing it as it is. When that mindfulness is applied again and again in a systematic and a consistent way, because the mind is knowing it according to its true nature, the deluded way of seeing it falls away from the mind. And then one glimpses in the beginning for moments uh, what it's like to have a body without there being a feeling of self, without there being a self view actually uh, grasping at the body. And when a practitioner has that experience, there's an experience of much less suffering, of putting down suffering. So the thing that suffers when we, when we notice <clears throat> it's a feeling of self that's suffering. And uh, my life is difficult. My job is too hard. I don't have enough money. Life is stressful. And, and uh, there's a feeling of self. My life, my difficulties. Fair enough. That's conventional reality. We have compassion for it. But in the experience of having some deeper insight into the nature of the body, simply seeing it very clearly with a strong quality of presence of mind, that feeling of identification, that grasping falls away from the mind. And in the meditation, the awareness knows the body as a body and made of elements. And that feeling of suffering goes, it's not there. When there isn't a self view identified with the body, there's no suffering. And uh, we're interested in Buddhist practice because the first truth is the noble truth of suffering. The third truth is the cessation of suffering. And we can experience it in moments at first and in periods later that when we put down the identification with it, the self-view falls away and then there's nobody there suffering. Tanatananam talked about the uh, Tatanga Vimukhi, temporary liberations. When we practice correctly, we will have periods of not suffering when we don't perceive it as a self. The Lord Buddha explains, we can contemplate the body as elements. The bhikkhu reviews the same body. However, it is placed, however, disposed by way of elements. Thus, in this body, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the wind element. Just as though a skilled butcher or his apprentice had killed a cow and was seated in the crossroads, 
with it cut up into pieces. So to what we could review is this same body by way of elements thus. In this body, there are earth element, a water element, a fire element, and air element. In this way, he abides contemplating the body of the body, internally, externally, both internally and externally. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body of the body. So this paragraph keeps coming up. And it's the, it's the eventual outcome of practicing the four foundations of mindfulness correctly. So one can contemplate the body parts and eventually one will abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. One can see these body parts as elements and eventually one will abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. It's not the case that you just understand the sutta, you understand the concept and then you can do that. Now I can abide independent, uh, not clinging to anything. That's a process. And when, when we practice correctly, we will have more and more moments when we can do that, longer periods where we can do that, and then it will be the final outcome. But at least Lord Buddha is pointing to the fact that contemplating in these ways, applying the mindfulness in these ways, is leading to a liberated, purified mind that doesn't suffer. So he also goes through the channel ground contemplations, and uh, I won't read that. You can read it. It's the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 10. And, uh, we're going to go into feeling now. So, Veda Nanusati, mindfulness of feelings. And how bhikkhus does a bhikkhu abide contemplating feelings as healing? Here, when a feeling is a pleasant feeling, a bhikkhu understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. When feeling a painful feeling, he understands, I feel a painful feeling. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling a worldly pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly pleasant feeling. When feeling an unworldly pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly pleasant feeling. So simply knowing feelings as they are, according to their, uh, how they're perceived by the mind. So pleasant feeling, simply knowing it's pleasant, unpleasant, knowing it's unpleasant, and then trying not to, this is, that's the thing about being mindful, isn't it? Trying not to fall into liking and disliking, having enough presence of mind that simply knows the quality of the feeling. If it's pleasant, if it's unpleasant, if it's neutral. And then we keep normally, the thing that makes it possible for us to be able to do that is that we are practicing with a meditation object. So the sutta does begin with the bhikkhu goes to the root of the tree and practices breath meditation. So this is, I think that's also instructive, the way that we are able to, and I've mentioned that many times in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Lord Buddha mentions in one of the introduction paragraphs that by practicing breath meditation, one can uh, develop the four foundations of mindfulness fully. So it's when one has some presence of mind, some clarity, that one is able to know feelings as they are, pleasant, neutral, unpleasant, and not falling for liking and disliking. It's very interesting when he talks about a worldly pleasant feeling and an unworldly pleasant feeling. So I think what Lord Buddha is referring to here is the uh, Lokutara uh, and the al Alokutara. So a, a person who's enlightened, they're going to have access to uh, the liberated state. So that's an unworldly, un not of this world. And there's going to be feelings associated with that. So feelings such as unshakable and deep peace. And uh, if you're starting to get into the if the, the, even amongst the jhanas, there's the unenlightened person who can have, can have jhanas. They have what's called the lokya jhana because that person is not enlightened. There's a, the enlightened practitioner has lokutara jhana. So it's the, uh, a Buddha can see this and enlightened beings can see this. But it, I think what, that's what's acknowledged in this sutta is that there are uh, a vast array of feelings and the more pure 
the mind is in this process of purification, that uh, the practitioner also will need to know those moment by moment, what, uh, what level of, uh, and he does say that later on, one knows when the mind is in a, uh, can't remember the exact phrase, but something like a great or grand state, or when the, when the mind is in a ordinary state. So he understands, I feel a worldly painful feeling. When feeling an unworldly painful feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly painful feeling. When feeling a worldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling. So what is that? That's neutral feeling, not impinging the mind in any particular way. When feeling, when feeling an unworldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel, an unworldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. So what might that be? That might be Ikeka as the Brahma Vihara, pure equilibrium, equipoise, a very beautiful state. It's not nothingness. Equanimity is not nothingness. Equanimity is equipoise, balance, uh, deep peace. Insight. In this way, he abides contemplating feelings as feelings internally, or he abides contemplating feelings as feelings externally. He abides contemplating feelings as feelings both internally and externally. So basically knowing all feelings that impinge on the mind-body experience. Or else he abides contemplating in feelings their nature of arising, or he abides contemplating feelings their nature of vanishing or ceasing. He abides contemplating in feelings their nature of both arising and vanishing. Or else, mindfulness that there is feeling is simply established in him to the extent necessary for fair knowledge and mindfulness. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how a bhikkhu abides contemplating feelings as feelings. So once again, this, uh, that's where the practice leads. But in the course of practice, one is going to uh, experience, as I said before, moments of liberation from suffering through seeing clearly the nature of feelings. So I, having a bit of time. I want to tell, I want to tell some practical things from my own practice as well. And uh, the things I heard from, from, uh, so we've done body and feelings. And next week we will do the mind and dhammas. But on the subject of contemplating feelings and how that can lead to non-clinging, I met a wonderful bhikkhu when I was a novice by the name of Hanya Wado, who was considered to be Lungta Mahabhava's foremost uh, foreign disciple. So he was believed to be, I, I believe, an, an anagami. So that's a third level of enlightenment, never returning to this world. At the, at the breakup of the body, at the end of a life, the anagami goes and lives in what's called sutawati, which is a very, very refined, superior realm, which is uh, higher than the Brahma realms. And they attain Arahantship there and never returned to the to the world again. So anyway, Tanya Wado was Bhikkhu, was deeply respected and, and highly regarded. I was fortunate enough to meet him as a novice at uh, Adhan Mahaprabhu's monastery 27 years ago. And uh, so one of the things he said was that he had got very good results in his practice by being aware of feelings in the chest area and noticing the way they changed. And so this was very helpful to me because uh, I tend to watch my breathing in the chest area. That's where, I, that's where I'm aware of the in and out breathing. And what one often finds is that whenever there's strong emotion around, there'll be feeling in that area. So you're trying to be aware of the breath, but there's another feeling there. It's not just the feeling of the breathing. Whatever the emotion is, is also in that area. And so, this is a, a very interesting uh, field of investigation. So normally people are caught in the thoughts. A lot of people are caught in the thoughts and they're not so mindful of the feelings underneath. And uh, 
and uh, but when one does break meditation diligently, sometimes uh, sometimes skillful or unskillful thinking can completely have ceased. But the undertone of the emotion that the thoughts are kind of coming out of is still there. And so what one can do is simply make it a practice of while you're being aware of the ingress and while you're being aware of the outbreath, you notice the way these other feelings are also changing. So you're aware of the breath, but you're also aware of its arriving and ceasing. And then these other feelings as they move around that area. So whatever hindrances, whatever of the five hindrances are in the mind, sensual craving, uh, aversion, restlessness, they all have feelings associated with them. And those feelings are in that area, the area of kind of where the base of mind is. Oftentimes we don't notice them, we notice them a little bit, we're kind of in the thought activity. But when you come down into that center, you have a look. And similarly, the Brahma Vihara's wholesome mind states have feeling, but the mind of loving kindness is feeling it's very pleasant, one what it calls in the divine abiding. And so similarly, when if you're just with your breathing and the mind becomes more peaceful, you start to feel a rapture, tranquility, serenity, well, those are feelings. And so you're just noticing, as Lord Buddha was describing, you notice a pleasant thing is pleasant, neutral is neutral. So when I was doing a meditation retreat with Lumpo Samedo in Amarwati, so I met, I met Lumpo Panyawado, and then I went to spend some time with Adam Samedo, and I was doing a 10-day retreat with him. And uh, I guess this was probably my first, I would call it, for that, at that point in my life, I would call it a big insight experience uh, for a novice Achalo. And so I was simply doing breath meditation. I was aware of feelings in this area. And I noticed that we, we, don't, we don't notice yet. Most people don't notice that the self view has a feeling component to it. Like the identifying with the body as a self, there's this grasping that's occurring throughout the whole body. It's a, my body, my knee pain, my back pain, it's very deep habit. And because it's like fish swimming in water, we haven't experienced something else yet. So we haven't, we don't notice that. We know there's some suffering, but we, we don't notice uh, quite how we're doing it or what it's like not to do it. And so in this, uh, as this meditation retreat progressed, and I was doing this uh, practice that Lumpur Paniwada had recommended, the feeling of a self disappeared from like my feet to my waist. And so there's this interesting experience of feeling like a me meditating with my struggles, but from the waist down, there was, there was, no, there was no feeling of self, but there was awareness of a body. Now what happened is that experience continued so that it came up through the abdomen and then it came through the chest and it got a bit stuck here at the, at the neck and it got on the, on the head kind of, kind of shook a little bit, it was a bit of tense. And, and what happened was that they just kept being mindful of the breathing and mindful of feelings as they arose and ceased. The feeling of being a self completely disappeared through the, through the top of my head. And then, so what there was, was there was this presence of mind and there was awareness of the body and awareness of feelings and no feeling of being a self. And this was a very important experience because that's when you, when the feeling of self comes back again after the meditation, that you, you've been able, to, I was able to have a glimpse for the first time. It is possible to be aware of the body and aware of feelings and not perceive it as a self. And in having that experience, all of the suffering is gone. Very, very helpful. And if we're looking at it in terms of a process of why that happened, it's uh, because the self view is based on grasping on permanence. And then when you're noticing change, change, arising, ceasing, arising, ceasing, arising, ceasing, changing, changing, changing. You're not feeding the delusion of perceiving it as a solid thing. And the more consistently you can do that, oh, arising, ceasing, changing, ceasing, arising, changing, ceasing, arising, changing, and ceasing. That the ignorance that is fed by the habitual grasping and identification as being a, being a self is just not being fed. And so in not feeding the delusion and in applying the antidote 
clearly knowing things as they are, feelings are just feelings. The self-view wasn't being fed, the delusion wasn't being fed, the ignorance being weakened. And it's possible for a deeper level of the mind to perceive the body and feelings without there being a feeling of a self there, without the self-view functioning in the mind. And uh, very, very helpful. That, that experience, I think, was a large part of what gave me the courage, the determination to go back to Thailand and become a bhikkhu, was there was that sense of, okay, I have glimpsed. And I think in the, the beginning stages, it's like this impenetrable veil, this self-view, it's the, the, the grasping, the clinging, the identification is so thick and so habitual. And fortunately, in my experience, once, once the mind has kind of glimpsed that, and because uh, a lot of fear can come up as well, like on one level, we know we're suffering and we don't want to suffer. But a lot of fear can come up around letting things go as well. Like better the devil you know. So it's like when when you have some experience of you can let go of identifying with things, identifying with things as being a self, and the mind is going to be fine, and the the world world doesn't fall apart, and it comes back again, unfortunately. <laughs> and then it becomes a memory. Oh, what a nice peaceful experience that was. But you can let go of the self view for periods of time and and trust that um you won't die. It won't kill you. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to mention that was one of the earliest uh, insight experiences I had through contemplating feelings in the chest area while being aware of uh, in and out breathing, having set awareness before me, and having not been falling into liking and disliking. And uh, oftentimes it is that kind of a situation that. Uh, 10 day retreat. So there's the getting up a bit earlier, sitting a bit longer, doing the walking, talking less. It's that kind of effort that's required to, to, to not feed the ignorance and the habits and to make the mindfulness and clear comprehension strong enough to start uh, piercing through the veil of ignorance and glimpsing uh, peacefulness, which is deeper than our habitual experience. So I have been waffling on a bit. I hope that something I felt was helpful. And we will continue next week with uh, part two of the practicing the Satipatthana. So I think we did have a couple of other questions to hear as well. Thank you, Ajahn. Is there any question two? Sila is generosity. In the retreat q and it says Sila is for the abandoning of the three fetters in order to gain wisdom. Please elaborate. I do not know what are the three fetters. I have not finished reading all the literatures of Buddhism. Thank you. So yes. Generosity. Was it, sorry, it was Sila, right? Generosity or Sila, sorry. Sila. Sila, yeah. Yes. Sila is generosity. So Sila is a higher practice, but they go together, right? So Dana is the giving away of physical things, giving away of time. And that's the foundation of the Buddhist practice as well. And Sila is sometimes virtue is sometimes described as a higher practice of generosity because one is offering freedom from fear to beings. So one is not going to relate to them in a greedy way or a malicious way, cruel way, and they will feel safe that when they're around you, you are committed to being ethical. And so, but uh, yes, yeah, so when we keep the sealer, the three root killers, greed, hatred, and delusion, if we're still feeding them, the Kilesas have a dark quality and, and to have insight into the true nature, the deeper nature of reality, then if, if the mind is too dark, that's not going to occur. It's a, it's a, and the quality of mindfulness and clear comprehension, qualities like Samadhi, they are bright. But for 
if we're still going to, when we have a lustful, passionate feeling, if we're going to act on that uh, a lot and often, then it's not really going to be possible to have insights into deeper reality because the darkness in the mind is, is, too, is too powerful. Similarly with the aversive and angry, that one of the precepts is not to have harsh speech and uh, not to kill beings. So if we still go out hunting, fishing, clobbering beings over the head, then, then the quality of darkness in the mind is, is normally going to be too thick for one to penetrate into ultimate reality. And that's what, that's what uh, causes the fetters to fall away. So one of the fetters is the, is the belief in rites and rituals. And what's interesting about this is that belief in rites and rituals is what will get you enlightened. So that's a fetter. What's interesting, so that would be kind of like, okay, if I do a million vows and 10 million mantras and pay respects to 100 arahants, I'll get enlightened. It's this kind of, it's a, a faith, a belief that if I do these things, I will get enlightened. Now, what, what skillful and correct practice demonstrates to us is that it's practice that leads to liberation. It's not, it's not the activities, but Lord Buddha doesn't say don't do rites and rituals. So we still do rites and rituals, but we do them mindfully and we do them for the purpose of generating merit or for brightening the mind or for uh, developing mindfulness. So we do rituals mindfully for the sake of developing mindfulness, but we don't believe that the ritual is what's going to get us enlightened. So I think in, in India, in ancient India, there was, there was a belief that if you sacrificed a certain number of buffaloes and oxen and these kind of things, that you would, you would get reborn in heaven or whatever if you made these offerings to Brahma or Kali or whatever, these kind of very deep ancient uh, habits and practices that that were around and actually it's it's the consistently practicing meditation on a foundation of being generous and ethical that's what it's the right practice which leads to the insight and once a person has had the insight and they know that it's like oh okay well these things were helpful for producing merit or these things were helpful like a hundred thousand prostrations might have been helpful for me to develop mindfulness of the body it might have been helpful for me to recollect the Buddha with gratitude, but it was the mindfulness itself and combined with wisdom or wise contemplation that led to the insight. Like once the practitioner, because in the experience of insight, there's going to be a great quality of presence of mind and clarity. So when the practitioner has the insight, they're going to notice what they were doing when they had it. And they're going to remember, oh, when, you, when you've had this putting down the feeling of self and, and the mind's liberated from the suffering that comes with that for a period of time and it's literally experiencing the deepest peace and contentment and coolness and fullness that it ever has it's going to notice that it's going to notice what was i doing when that occurred oh that's how it works so and then it's glimpsing in when the sense itself falls away and the mindfulness of clear comprehension really does see a body as just a body feelings as just feelings thoughts are just thoughts and experiences uh, something where the self-view isn't permeating that, that's when the self-view, another of the fetters, is uh, abandoned. But it has to be, for the stream entry, it has to be a very deep. So normally the way it works is people will have glimpses of it and then they'll have what's called vipassana insights. And then the, some people even will then have a stream in, uh, Gotravu Vijnana, which is a changing of lineage insight where they glimpse Nibbana. And then the power of karma and, and delusion pulls them back to this shore. The mind doesn't, what they call, flip over into the Nibbana element. But, but having had that insight, having glimpsed Nibbana, the merit of that, the power of that, Lord Buddha explains that they will attain to stream entry before death or during death. It's like it's so powerful that during the dying process or before dying, one will get a path of stream entry. And then some people have the path of stream entry, but not the full fruit, have to keep practicing. And then they get the fruit of stream entry as well. So 
it depends how many lifetimes the person's been practicing. These great practitioners we see in the Buddhist times were listening to one sutra and becoming dream enterers or becoming arahants. Most of them probably had made vows that they wanted to attain stream entry while listening to a Buddha. They wanted they specifically, so they were kind of right and they were waiting for Lord Buddha to come because they wanted to hear teaching from the Buddha and they wanted to get enlightened while listening to a Buddha. But for people who have less accumulated virtue, it's the process of glimpsing, glimpsing more deeply, experiencing momentarily, experiencing for a deeper period of time. And then all of those experiences are, are building the wisdom, spiritual power, the, those five spiritual powers. And then eventually, finally, they get powerful enough to lead the mind to an insight which is unshakable, the stream entry. So the Tanajan Anand says the stream entry experience usually goes for about two or three days. So it, it's like that, that sense of the mind really has changed now. It really has experienced Nibbana. It knows what Nibbana is. And it knows what practice would lead to that. It's tasted uh, liberation to the point where uh, it knows it's uh, significantly liberated. But as I was saying, different people have different levels of virtue. And uh, for the people who get those paths and fruits 2,600 years after the Buddha, it tends to be a few lifetimes process. And, uh, depending how much, how much practice uh, a practitioner has done. So abandoning the belief that rites and rituals will get one enlightened. Belief in a self-view. And I've forgotten the third fetter. Do you know it, JC? What's the third fetter that's abandoned the stream entry? You're doing a quick search, aren't you? You're asking Google. <laughs> Does Google know? Sila Bata Baramasa. Uh, it's oh, the doubt. Identity. Of course. Doubt. Of course, yeah. So. Yet seeing, when seeing through the self-view and experiencing something superior, experiencing Nibbana, tasting the liberated mind, one has no doubt as to the Buddha, his teaching, his practices, Sangha, and also with regards to what one has just experienced. It's like one will know that that was the deepest peace and the most wondrous experience you've had to date and yeah there will be a, a quality of deep faith and confidence about that so isn't that wonderful isn't that the mind just experienced a quality of imperturbability of deep 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 peace with no suffering yes and uh, as i was saying before one one will it was good practice that leads to that experience so there will be presence of mind, a lot of presence of mind for the experience to occur. And then even more so directly after that experience. So the practitioner will know what they were doing that led to the insight. They will know how wonderful the insight was. And then uh, afterwards, they will have no doubt. There's a, in the Awada Patimoka, it says, Nibbana is superior, say the wise. And there will be that experience of, yeah, well, that really was the best thing <laughs> so far, <laughs> like, and uh, so yes, one abandoned. And the sila is what is making the the virtue, the commitment to the virtue, the ethical standards, is what is making the darkness in the mind go from kind of black to gray in a way. It's like making the darkness less and preparing it for these flashes of something brighter. But uh, we need to do that. We need to lower the level of darkness. Lord Buddha, in various ways, Buddha describes it. He says that his teachings are for those with little dust in their eyes. So, you know, keeping the precept is what's helping us to wash the dust out of our eyes or not allow the dust to be in our eyes, to come back into our eyes too quickly. We uh, keep restraining ourselves skillfully with a long term uh, 
commitment to something better than sensuality or expressing aversion or acting on covetousness, etc. So getting, you know, not going for the temporary deluded liberation of getting wasted. We're trying getting stoned. We're, we're aiming for the full liberation that comes from sobriety and clarity. Question three, dear Ajahn, currently I'm facing some obstacles <laughs> and fear because there is a violent fight there. Vajran Yanadana who cannot rejoice my dana to Buddha and body tree daily. She's trying to harm me like kicking my back when I was chanting, disturb me, etc. How can I protect myself from this type of circumstances with metta? Yeah. So I know I know the person who's asking the question, and I know where she was, and I think I even know the violent fighter Vajrayana nun. <laughs> and uh, she's not that violent, she's a, bit, a little bit violent. So this is the thing about when you when one practices in a public, somewhat public place, it's uh, there's going to be one's kind of opening the uh, doors for karmas to ripen. And uh, it's one of the things I actually love about Bodhaya is it's a real, it's a real challenge, a creative challenge. You need to have everything in your toolbox as a contemplative ready to go because you don't know what's walking around the corner next and uh, or what's going to fall on your head from above or what's going to <laughs> walk into you or bump into you. So it's a very interesting place. But of course, practicing in a less crowded time, it's uh, in the hot season, there's many, many fewer people. In, in some ways, there's kind of safety in numbers. There's uh, like quite a lot of noise in my experience, practicing book guy with quite a lot of noise, loud Tibetan pujas or big groups doing their pujas is less impinging than if I can hear just one Thai person sitting a few meters behind me complaining about the bathroom or, or complaining about how much something costs. And so it gets a bit it gets a bit harder when when there's not many people and then people are being kind of possessive about things. So basically, Bodh Gaya is the place where it's the place of liberation and it's also the place of Mara's army. So basically, it's a very interesting place. And I, I find that those vibrations are kind of always there. Because if you practice diligently, it's like you can smell, you can taste, you can touch, you can intuit. You're so close to Nibbana. It really does feel closer there. And there are going to be so many things that come and challenge you from actually experiencing that more deeply. It's very um, bittersweet. Uh, 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. But I love it. I love practicing in Bhagaya. But basically, you're going to have to expect some karma to ripen. And... Uh, Yes, and sometimes one, one has to learn from observing others, like what not to do. So what this, what this nun is describing is that she's offering her special items as a puja to the Buddha. And there's another practitioner there who's covetous and she wants to offer her special items. So they're going to be fighting over the space or their person's getting covetous or, th or threatened or possessive. So, you know, basically you, I think accepting that it's karma is helpful. And one accepts, okay, well, I must have behaved like this in the past myself. That's my experience in this. And I don't want to in continue creating that kind of karma. So when I'm going to not be contentious, the best thing that you can offer that person so that they don't make too much bad karma is not reacting. So it's like you, even if a person comes and kicks your bag while you're meditating, you leave that with them. Obviously, if they kick you, it's a different level of, uh, you might need to do something. You might need to do something about that. But if it's just somebody being a little bit immature and uh, possessive, then uh, accept it as your karma. Try to have metta for the being. Don't make any more karma. And one contemplates, yeah, isn't that a shame? Come all the way to Bogaya and uh, to abandon attachment and actually cultivate more attachment. It's uh, one makes a note, I don't want to do that. So make sure in my practice, I don't do that. And, uh, and trust that the, the merit of the Buddha, the future Buddhas and the Devas will receive your offering. And uh, yes. 
keep the mind in the middle, not falling into covetousness or grief for the world. Sometimes, you know, the, the Vajrayana say, when you meet someone who's difficult with a lot of negative energy, you thank that person for being your teacher that has come to teach you extra patience. And they say, you should visualize that person above your head as your special teacher. So, and it, it sounds a bit silly, but if you do it sincerely, you really can take difficult people as a, oh, here she comes. Okay, get ready. I'm not going to react. And, and sometimes you cannot react. It's like, look at that. This person taught me, especially when you're doing something in a repetitive way for a period of days and weeks. If you know about the time that they're going to come, you've got these hours of preparation, you can prepare, oh, here she comes. And you can kind of gauge yourself. How well did I keep my mind in the middle? How well did I manage my reactivity? And uh, if, you, if you're going through the various stages of cultivating compassion from being uh, ordinary compassion to including all neutral beings, including difficult beings, and metta to include neutral beings and include difficult beings. It's like when she's coming, you can get your metta really pumping and you can blast her with metta, even if she's knocking over your offerings or kicking your, your, your bag. There's no reason you can't have metta for that person at that time. And Bokaya is a really good time to recollect that because remember that after he was enlightened, Mara's army rallied with such frightful might, like he never seen before. And what was Lord Buddha's response to that? Lord Buddha's response to that was to spread metta. And he actually described metta as being the best weapon. So it's like, because he wasn't using metta to harm, he was using metta to protect his bodily formation. And it's described that the Mara's weapons, when they hit Lord Buddha's purified aura, turned to blossoms and fell to the ground around him. So that's what we have to do. We have to take people's barbs and daggers and turn them into blossoms around our beautiful minds, radiating love and kindness. So I wish you every success in that endeavor. Sadhu. Thank you, Ajahn. My pleasure, my honor. Good to see you all. Nice to practice yeah. together. Uh, nice uh, together. Uh, Thank you, Ajahn Achala. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, Ajahn. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you.